The Future History of Energy and Transportation Documenting the paradigm shift from the era of oil and internal combustion, to the era of robotics By Julian Cox Narrated by the author with the aid of an artificial intelligence Chapter 23 Finally, a deep dive about batteries In the pursuit of this exploration and rebuilding expertise from the ground up, from special relativity to the global energy and transportation economy, the humble battery has been touched on a number of times. In all cases thus far, what has been discussed is a rechargeable battery, otherwise known as a battery made up of secondary cells. This is not the only kind of battery. The definition of a primary versus a secondary cell is simply that a primary cell is not rechargeable and a secondary cell is. There are still other kinds of cells such as flow cells and fuel cells that involve a tank of some reactant passing through an electrochemical exchanger. For the sake of brevity these are discounted from further consideration because at best they aim to address temporary, and often imaginary, limitations of rechargeable cells that rechargeable cells in volume production are predestined to overcome in the near term, if they have not already done so, especially in ground vehicles. Additionally these cell types fail the tests of materials level efficiency and service and systems level efficiency by presenting costly and wholly avoidable balance of system duplication in both vehicles and infrastructure. Issues that are readily resolved with the minimum of cost and complexity by sizing a rechargeable battery on board a vehicle appropriately, that can accept electrical input from any generation source, and meet the full customer requirement without need of an elaborate range extender. Furthermore, the desire on the part of vendors to corral consumers into a pay-at-the-pump or subscription-type fueling model is strongly outmaneuvered by ride-sharing, autonomous or not, where pre-planned charging at lowest cost can be expected to be the norm. Meaning if someone wants to travel a certain number of miles, they don't have to buy fuel or any equivalent to get what they want. That task is delegated. Passengers can just buy the miles directly without ongoing commitment and the shift from on-demand fueling, to on-demand mileage will strand any form of convenience fueling model without market leverage. This is true be it gasoline, diesel, hydrogen, flow cell electrolytes or even, importantly, analogs of pay-at-the-pump business models for roadside vehicle charging. A vehicle manufacturer that capitalizes passive vehicle charging infrastructure assets, including solar, battery storage and the chargers themselves, to supply low or no added cost charging to its customers, especially in an autonomous fleet setting, can achieve this substantially within the traditional budgets applied to vehicle advertising and brand marketing. In a manually operated setting, levying a price on roadside fast charging is required to encourage home and destination charging market behavior, to maximize the utility of fast chargers for mid-journey requirements, and to discourage unfair use. Such as operating a taxi fleet surrounding a free charger, intended to facilitate occasional long-distance travel for a broad customer base. Erecting a modest paywall to encourage customers to charge their vehicles independently, is very distinct from a model that assumes the leverage to force customers to pay the stated price at the roadside as a primary revenue and profit stream, or else get stranded in their vehicles without transportation. In the case of an autonomous fleet, fair use of charging infrastructure for its intended purpose is programmable and opportunities arise to cover the cost of energy elsewhere in the value chain entirely, from a pay-at-the-pump analog low cost, and free at the point of use, charging is much more impactful and persuasive in terms of competitive positioning than any TV spot ad, and the investor in charging infrastructure accumulates charging assets instead of burning cash on media outlay. Low cost or free at the point of use roadside charging apparatus makes for great alternative ad copy, versus functionless billboards. Much of the same rationale applies to retail and hotel locations wishing to attract customers and the same applies to tourism and business districts and so on until a lack of courtesy charging, to attract human and autonomous traffic, is quite likely to be regarded a demerit to a location in the same way as a lack of litter bins or public Wi-Fi. This is an overwhelmingly competitive profit-motivated construct that is sustainable owing to an asset-based value chain on a whole-of-society scale and this is clearly terminal to fuel retailing models of all descriptions, and hence vehicles that require fuel, including vehicles based on hybrid range extenders, fuel cells and flow cells. Authors note, from the small print of Toyota's market offering for the Mirai, customers who lease a 2021 or 2022 Mirai will receive complimentary fuel for three years or $15,000, whichever comes first. 
The idea that consumers would like their governments to deploy taxpayers' money to assist an industry group and trap them in a technology, requiring Toyota's estimate of $5,000 per year of hydrogen to operate, to the exclusion of the option of just buying solar panels at ever-declining prices to charge their car at home, is a highly questionable premise. Where buy $5,000 of solar panels, once, on a price curve that is having every few years, offset by a similar value added to a private home, will take care of energy for private transportation for 25 to 30 years. Clear-mindedness regarding vehicle architecture along these lines comes with the added benefit of averting the monumental mistake of investing public or private funds in specialist hydrogen fueling infrastructure, on the eve of all electric range as a commodity, sub-15 minute highway charging and vehicle autonomy, cars that will drive off and return charged, without troubling the user at all. This, in addition to home and destination charging covering countless millions of outlets that are agnostic to evolution in energy harvesting technology whether the starting condition of the grid is gas, coal, nuclear fission in the end state solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, thorium molten salt, nuclear fusion or anything else. Naturally, one of the most basic applications of full autonomy and prospect is the ability for each car to go away and charge itself, while the owner is asleep or otherwise occupied. Thereby solving the question of apartment living, on street parking and destination charging, in the absence of somewhere to simply plug in while parked. The next step is for vehicles to show up charged only when required and the remainder of the time be out earning an income for an owner, intermixed with visiting the car wash and attending the occasional service. Logically, a strong tip on the advent of autonomous ride sharing, would be to invest in car wash operations. Before focusing exclusively on rechargeable batteries, one of the most impressive forms of primary cell in prospect is also essentially the most basic. The lithium metal air cell. Metal air cells have the distinction of replacing the cathode of a battery with oxygen from the air, potentially eliminating half or more of the battery's mass. A single-use primary lithium air cell, is able to achieve a theoretical energy density of 11,600 watt-hours per kilogram. This is more than 3,800 percent, 38 times, higher than the cells used in a 2016 Tesla Model S P100D to achieve 315 miles of range. On an all else being equal basis this theoretical lithium air battery would drive the same Model S 11,514 miles on a single charge using a battery containing the same weight of cells, simply by swapping the contents of the battery tray. Naturally all things are not equal. For example there are good reasons not to drive around with 11,970 miles worth of chemical energy potential, 3.42 megawatt hours, on board an ordinary passenger vehicle in the event of an accident, when most of it is baggage for most of the duration, requiring extreme measures to contain that energy safely throughout. Also 11,970 total lifetime miles prior to replacement with a new battery is never likely to be competitive per mile with a battery of less than one-tenth of the capacity but capable of being recharged to deliver considerably more than 300,000 lifetime miles using an external supply of cheap electricity. There is a less reactive aluminum air primary battery slated to be made available for commercial use by a company called Finergy. Aluminum air has a theoretical limit of 8,000 watt-hours per kilogram and prototype vehicle applications of batteries of this type are achieving some percentage of this figure, to deliver roughly a thousand miles of range on a single charge. Unfortunately the only charge there is between recycling and remanufacturing. Recycling and remanufacturing is a feature in common with all automotive cells, including current secondary cells that deliver many hundreds of thousands of miles in service. Hence the value of the concept of megawatt-hours lifetime throughput, that speaks directly to amortization. There is ongoing research work exploring ways to make metal air cells rechargeable and so to increase lifetime mileage beyond a single cycle. This is not impossible, but it is hampered due to the presence of air pollutants, that over time will tend to foul the desired interface with oxygen. Filtering, scrubbing or distillation of air with the ideal target of isolating pure atmospheric oxygen on board a vehicle in traffic, is a significant balance of system issue that is readily resolved at minimum cost and complexity, by using a sealed rechargeable cell with an oxidizing cathode that has no such requirement. Another curious property of a theoretical rechargeable metal air cell is that it will exhaust pure oxygen upon charging. Venting oxygen with sufficient dilution to avoid elevating the combustibility of common household materials, in an enclosed space, 
is another interesting challenge. Nothing here is impossible but this technology is not on the critical path to the future. The take-home message here is the theoretical limit of 11,600 watt-hours per kilogram for a lithium-based battery. A 10% advance in that direction amounting to an additional 1,130 watt-hours per kilogram, from the current state-of-the-art in volume commercial production of circa 300 watt-hours per kilogram, leaving 90% of R&D headroom on the table, in trade for avoiding any need to get into the bind of attempting to manage ambient air composition on the fly will deliver cells well in excess of 1,000 watt-hours per kilogram and with it, practical ground vehicle range between charging in excess of 1,000 miles per charge and open up electric long-haul flight and transcontinental shipping as ordinary. To take perhaps the most extreme challenge for batteries, international container shipping, a typical large container ship of 8,000 TEU, having the ability to carry 8,020-foot shipping containers or their equivalent, would require a battery of 12,500,000 kWh to go 11,520 nautical miles, halfway around the Earth, with some extra for avoiding obstacles like continents, 24 hours per day for 20 days at 24 knots. This would be required to replace 4,500 tons of bunker oil costing about $1.4 million per journey. At $100 per kWh totaling $1.25 billion, this system would require 913 journeys to break even. This is a borderline financing proposition. The battery would weigh around 32,000 tons at 400 watt-hours per kilogram, which would marginally offset useful payload capacity, despite deducting the 4,500-ton weight of the bunker oil and an engine of typically 2,300 tons. Many container ships already have drivetrains in common with diesel-electric trains on land, meaning the propellers are driven by electric motors. Note also that even today's batteries are reasonably competitive with liquid fuels on the metric of volumetric energy density, which is arguably more important for container shipping than weight, when also considering the potential to delete a ship's fuel tanks, engine room and funnels, making more room for payload. This scenario would seem to suggest a 10 times cost improvement per kilowatt hour is called for, to achieve a crushing competitive advantage over bunker oil in this application by exposing upwards of a million dollars per trip in cost savings relative to bunker oil, with break-even on capital invested in less than 100 trips. The benefit, to enjoy another several thousand battery cycles, journeys, at a million dollars per trip of cost savings. A 10 times improvement in cost per kilowatt hour would hint at the 2030 to 2040 timeframe. Of course container routes between far closer ports such as Japan to China or US to Europe will become competitive for battery-powered container shipping far sooner, requiring a battery of far less than half the capacity, weight and cost. Improvements in energy density are both desirable and expected in a similar time frame. The take-home message here is that technical feasibility is not the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is cost and competitiveness is essentially a matter of time and battery production capacity. Indeed there are cells in the lab of 1,200 watt-hours per kilogram already, lithium sulfur for example, where the challenge has moved downstream to contemplating cycle life and the practicalities of manufacturing at scale. This more or less hints at the entire issue with batteries and that is one of balancing competing properties and advancing those properties simultaneously, rather than one at the expense of another. Hardly a week goes by without the announcement of some new breakthrough in battery technology, only to discover the headline feature is a trade-off between energy density and cycle life or some such. A genuine advance, must of course advance at least one capability without retracting previous gains in another mission-critical feature. To summarize some of the properties of existing batteries. 1. Batteries that drive a car over a thousand miles per charge. 2. Batteries that are very low cost per unit of capacity. 3. Batteries that are free of toxic and controversial materials. 4. Batteries that can deliver very high power. 5. Batteries that are inherently stable and very safe if damaged. 6. Batteries that offer many thousands of recharge cycles. 7. Batteries that will hold charge for many years. 8. Batteries that will perform well at very low end, or very high temperatures. 9. Batteries with extremely high charge acceptance rates. 10. Batteries with extremely high round-trip energy efficiency. 
What this means is that nature has on offer a choice of everything we could possibly want in a battery. No physical limit prevents greater than 1,000 mile range electric vehicles that outperform anything currently on the roads, and deliver millions of miles in service prior to end of life recycling. After all, a turbine or an internal combustion engine is only really a hydrocarbon airflow battery with gross balance of system, materials wastage and fueling infrastructure issues and a comparatively feeble mechanism for converting chemical energy to kinetic energy. The less good news is that Mother Nature is shockingly stubborn when it comes to handing out all of her secrets at once in a single battery device. Nevertheless, today's state-of-the-art batteries and high-volume commercial production are already more suitable than gasoline for most use cases, in vehicles of mid-market price and above, and are already insurmountable by gasoline in all cases, even prior to predictable developments, when contemplating ramifications for an autonomous networked fleet. Where for example inconveniencing a person while a vehicle is on charge is not a key issue, especially given the predictably ordinary case of unoccupied autonomous vehicles, making their way quietly through the city streets at night, to attend a charging garage in preparation for the morning, with zero time penalty or inconvenience to any person at all. The idea of allotting energy efficiency to batteries may have caught some off guard. This is referring to voltage dropped across the pack under both discharge and charging loads, not coulombic efficiency indicative of milliamp hour capacity attrition, due to side reactions, although technically coulombic efficiency remains a minor contributor to energy efficiency even in a pack of ample cycle life. It may seem redundant to say it, but a purely battery-driven vehicle does not have a fuel tank. The flip side is that a battery cell is a functional part of the mechanism to drive an electric vehicle. It is an electrochemical machine that is in the loop, just like the cylinders and pistons of an engine. As previously touched upon in analogies to engines, the volts and amps do the job of a piston rod while the motor does the job of the crankshaft. Hence it makes sense to consider the efficiency of the electrochemical reaction and the electrical performance of the metal components of a battery. Optimizing battery performance for a vehicle is hardcore engineering, just as interesting, if anything much more so, than working with engines, and the possible results to strive for at this juncture are more impressive both technically and commercially. Vehicle batteries are just chemicals in a can? By the same standards a Formula One engine is just chemicals in a can, that rattles. In both cases, no. Absolutely not. The same level of engineering fascination deservedly belongs to batteries, as well as to motors, inverters and the software that drives them, the architecture, subsystems and the interconnects also. The reason why battery efficiency is a thing and fuel tank efficiency is not, is that unlike supplying fuel via an engine to an exhaust, the battery cell is a component of the electrical circuit that goes through the motor via the inverter and back through the battery. The battery is not just a batch of energy that supplies the drivetrain, the battery is the main part of the machinery that drives the wheels. The battery is also the component that absorbs the energy of deceleration, under regenerative braking. In addition, when the vehicle is on charge the battery is switched to become an integral part of the electrical circuit with the charger and its power supply. In this way any drivetrain energy that is produced as heat in the battery, instead of powering the wheels, is deducted from total vehicle energy efficiency. In a basic sense, battery inefficiency is the product of joule heating in the battery. This is a combination of impedance and ohmic losses. Collectively internal resistance times the square of the current passing through the battery in amps. At the vehicle level, joule heating comes in addition to any net balance of system losses due to thermal management, electronic monitoring and charge balancing. These are all areas that offer room for engineering refinement in addition to refinements to the efficiencies of motors, high power contactors, fuses and cables, drive inverters, chargers and the thermal management of all of the above. These are subject to vehicle architecture efficiencies such as scavenging for cabin heat, reuse of heat for thermal management of batteries and systems wide, through software and network strategies for interactions with time and use patterns. Looking at a battery cell, for example a lithium-ion cell. Internal resistance, IR, has two components. Electrical conductivity, or the inverse, ohmic resistance, of the sum of metal current collectors, typically aluminum and nickel or copper foil plates, internal welds, of current collectors to cell terminals, and intra-pack connections, which may double as cell-level fuses of some appreciable resistance in order to function as such. 
The second component of IR is ionic conductivity. Because if the ions don't flow freely in the chemical part of the circuit internal to the cell, neither will the corresponding electrons in the electrical circuit via the exterior. This is an electrochemical reaction and, within reason net of capacitance, it needs to balance such that when a positive lithium ion is chemically attracted to cross the separator, typically a microscopically perforated polymer insulator that conducts ions but not electrons, a matching electron must journey around the electrical circuit to fill the void otherwise nothing happens. Vice versa the electron that is attracted around the circuit must be matched with an ion crossing the separator or again, nothing happens. Ionic conductivity, or ion transport to be more precise, is chiefly that which gives rise to capacitance and impedance effects in a battery. Ions can accumulate in the electrolyte ready to go, hence an initial spark when shorting a battery, or initial launch acceleration for that matter. These effects can also express themselves in similar ways to inertia and momentum, on the scale of milliseconds, which starts to matter a lot when making demands on a battery that are not smooth and constant. This is why internal resistance or IR is typically measured as an impedance at a certain frequency, usually 1 kHz for standard test equipment. However the frequency that matters in practice is related to the variable demands of the drive inverter, a device that typically uses time division multiplexing to vary power throughput resulting in a draw on the battery and pulse modulated DC. A drive inverter that overuses a battery as a smoothing capacitor is suboptimal for efficiency and cycle life, although a large enough battery can be forgiving. Generally speaking the closer the demand is to unmodulated DC the better, which calls for large capacitors to be built into the inverter, except where this pushes up inverter cost, weight and volume excessively. Another trade-off. Regarding battery efficiency. Improvements at the anode, cathode, electrolyte and cell separator that deliver improved ionic conductivity will increase watt-hour per mile efficiency of the battery, and therefore the vehicle overall. Improving ionic conductivity is generally uncompromisingly good. Conversely, reducing ohmic resistance of metal components by the most obvious means, more substantial metal foils and internal welds, presents an immediate trade-off with energy density, by displacing active with passive materials per unit mass. Answers without such a trade-off are to be found in metallurgy, surface doping and etching, format optimization, electrolyte composition and separator design. Bottom line, batteries for vehicles are a far more fascinating engineering challenge than batteries for pen lights. Update. A stunning application of all of these principles at once was unveiled in the Tesla 4680 tab less cell. The elimination of traditional tabs stamped into the metal current collectors within a cell, and instead to connect the entire edge of each electrode to the end terminal and the cell casing respectively, eliminates both a major source of internal resistance and materials inefficiency, both in production, and in terms of volumetric and specific energy density, owing to the increased ratio of active to balance of cell materials, where before there were tab welds. So backing up a bit, we were discussing a menu of features of a battery distributed across numerous different battery types, all of which are available with astonishing properties. Properties that are shockingly difficult to combine in a single battery, with cost effectiveness as the bottom line. An example of the current state of the art in volume commercial production is the Tesla Panasonic NCA cell. A lithium ion variant with a liquid organic electrolyte, a polymer separator, a nickel cobalt aluminum cathode and a carbon silicon anode. This is borderline cheap to mass produce both mechanically and chemically, relatively non-toxic, landfill safe and 100% recycled regardless, relatively prone to thermal runaway at the cell level, compared with cells that are relatively unsuitable at the cell or the pack level, reasonable in terms of temperature range tolerance, excellent in terms of calendar life, reasonable in terms of energy density, good in terms of power density without excessive attrition to cycle life, and excellent in terms of cycle life, even if deep cycled. Charge acceptance rate is moderately good or moderately bad depending on whether the benchmark is other batteries or other technologies altogether, such as the supercapacitors used in KERS applications. Result, with outstanding balance of system and software monitoring and control system engineering, this cell is just about good enough to enable the production of vehicles that outperform new mid-market, mild luxury gasoline vehicles of a similar price, on every metric except for use cases requiring extreme uninterrupted range at very high continuous vehicle speeds. 
a 50% increase in energy density and a 30-50% to improvement in cost per kilowatt-hour capacity from a benchmark of the current state-of-the-art, coinciding with one click or network triggered unattended autonomous charging and a doubling of charge acceptance rates, will naturally eclipse gasoline internal combustion performance and convenience in any realistic scenario, including the Autobahn use case, and dominate an autonomous fleet on economic grounds, utterly. The latter because fuel, engine maintenance and amortization divisible by vehicle longevity, surface as the key cost drivers when unmasked from the cost of a human operator and within reason, not the initial vehicle price. C. Dynamics of autonomous mileage markets. The prime targets for desirable improvement at the cell level therefore, are energy density and charge acceptance rates while simultaneously maintaining acceptable levels of safety at the pack level, or whole vehicle level or whole transport system level, all the while reducing cost per kilowatt hour of capacity and cost per lifetime megawatt hour throughput, as a function of capacity time cycle life. While all of these are desirable, None of these improvements is any longer a gatekeeper to dominance in autonomous mobility in an autonomous fleet setting. Very high power for acceleration and cornering G-force is unlikely to be critical to customer value in a vehicle dedicated to general city transit, besides the corner case of active collision avoidance, by deploying high acceleration to evade a collision. Even so, given adequate motor and inverter peak power handling a large battery will support momentary high acceleration for a short duration as a free byproduct of the high capacity necessary for long range. In the autonomous fleet setting, high continuous range without recharging is valuable at the margins of trip flexibility and duty ratio, but readily mitigated by network effects. Such that for example a fairly basic city car running low on charge may simply be scheduled for charging and met by another city car or a highway optimized vehicle as required for a particular journey, or as desired on grounds of passenger preference, broad market preference, vehicle availability, proximity and so on. From a baseline of the 2016 to 2017 Tesla Panasonic NCA cell and its known performance within Tesla's packs and vehicles, Energy density improvements in parallel with cost savings per kilowatt-hour capacity and megawatt-hour lifetime throughput, plus improved charge acceptance rates alongside undiminished power density, define the general direction of good and with it a broadening of the ability to electrify diverse and more powerful machines. Like this. A Tesla all-electric semi-truck featuring at least 500 miles of range fully loaded. In pursuit of this goal, there is a mixture of both helpful synergies as well as some priorities that conflict. Some helpful synergies in the direction of higher capacity batteries at the pack level. The internal resistance of a battery is divisible by its amp hour capacity. In this regard the larger the battery the better. Except where thermal management of a large thermal mass and weight impacting rolling resistance offsets gains. The demands on the power density properties of each cell are divisible by kilowatt hour capacity both for charge and discharge. A higher capacity battery is helpful towards delivering high power for acceleration, in accepting high regenerative braking currents and in diluting the impacts of power-related stress on cycle life, primarily dual heating but also potential exposure to under-voltage conditions, software permitting. This benefit is attenuated in the case of increased battery mass which necessarily propagates throughout to the mass of the vehicle's chassis, brakes and crash structures, Hence higher capacity is only a clear win when increased capacity is derived as a function of increased energy density. There are marginal benefits when simply installing a heavier battery. A higher capacity battery will undergo relatively fewer charge and discharge cycles, to deliver some or many hundreds of thousands of miles of service life in a vehicle, compared to a lower capacity battery. Because, to a somewhat unfair approximation, the total lifetime mileage is a function of cycle life, multiplied by the range attainable from each full charge of the battery. A higher capacity battery has proportionately more scope to be operated day-to-day -day within a range of charge states well removed from the limits of fully charged and fully discharged conditions, where cycle life and capacity attrition is more likely to occur, and to be more prominent on account of speciation of the electrochemical reaction pathway. For example the production of a few non-rechargeable chemical species such as molecules of lithium oxide towards the limits of discharge, or a few molecules signifying the partial breakdown of the electrolyte towards the limits of full charge. Hence the larger capacity battery offers the possibility of compounding gains in lifetime mileage as a function of improved cycle life and increased range per cycle. 
Additional lifetime mileage speaks to battery electric drivetrain amortization, if not vehicle amortization as a whole, or profitability, markedly so in the autonomous ride-sharing context. Amply offsetting incremental cost of the larger battery in terms of total cost, or profit, of ownership, insofar as available battery supply is not the critical bottleneck for scale of fleet. Where brute battery supply is the constraint on scale of fleet, then there is some calculus to consider, to somewhat sacrifice the maximum possible lifetime mileage of a vehicle by limiting battery size in the here and now, in order to divide available battery supply between more vehicles, whose accelerated expiry should nonetheless intersect the curve of abundant future supply of batteries at a lowered cost per kilowatt hour. Energy density improvements aimed at producing large capacity batteries tend to run in sync with cost per kilowatt hour capacity improvements as a function of lowered mass of materials per unit of capacity. Thus scaling the battery to target a lifetime mileage consistent with the balance of the vehicle, would appear to be a strong optimization in the absence of exigencies to maximize scale of initial fleet while facing battery supply constraints, especially with the advent of full vehicle autonomy. C. Challenges for incumbent automakers, and a possible solution to auto market disruption. Note that dividing lifetime mileage deliverable from a traction battery by the mileage deliverable from a single deep cycle, such as 315 US EPA miles, is somewhat unfair. On the one hand, because it runs contrary to design intent to operate traction batteries within a band of charge states specifically to avoid deep cycling. On the other hand the full range on a battery charge will taper due to battery capacity attrition that occurs over repeated cycles, such that end of life might be specified at 80% of the original capacity, or vehicle range, when compared to the initial 315 miles, and range tapering, assuming it isn't masked in software, isn't linear. Meaning the first 5% loss of capacity would typically occur relatively swiftly over 50 to 100 cycles, while the next 1% to 2% of capacity attrition would typically take hundreds of cycles over a period of years. Whereas masking the initial extra 5% of range in software would doubtless deliver the strongest customer satisfaction over a lifetime of ownership. Permitting a traction battery to be cycled until actual failure should probably, naturally, be disbarred in firmware incorporated into the design of the pack. Authors note, defining the physical attributes of something you own in software, or firmware, raises a curious philosophical point, a battery that you own that is physically 80% as good as new dies in firmware. Do you own a dead battery? Yes. If you accept a failsafe programmed in firmware is genuinely an attribute of the battery, but this is somehow different from an engine giving up by physically spewing oil or throwing a piston rod as opposed to the vendor programming an ECU to stop the engine working in order to minimize the chance of that happening to you. Despite the advantages of larger batteries enumerated above, all else being equal, moving in the direction from lower to higher capacity batteries is naturally antagonistic, unhelpful, to the objectives of lowered initial vehicle cost, lowered weight, lowered battery pack volume and maximizing the number of vehicles that can be produced for a given supply of batteries, and safety, in the absolute, meaning in the event of total loss of containment. Hence the vehicle level efficiency optimization of electric vehicles is particularly important in relation to battery size reduction. Materials level efficiency is discussed herein. Much more so than societal level energy efficiency in terms of moving markets, but extreme efficiency for the avoidance of battery capacity bloat to compensate, is critically important nonetheless. Safety. Better described as containment and control. First of all, it needs to be stated that the general and emotive term safety as in safe battery chemistry or safe batteries, is largely unhelpful to comprehension. There is no discussion of seeking flame retardant gasoline, because extreme inflammability is a desirable property for powering internal combustion engines, in much the same way that the sharpness of a kitchen knife is a desirable property for preparing a salad. To move an ordinary sized passenger vehicle 200 to 400 miles using 200 to 400 watt hours per mile of energy requires energy on board the vehicle at full charge between 40 kilowatt hours and 160 kilowatt hours by the math. It is conceivable to develop an attractive highway capable EV consuming less than 250 watt hours per mile and indeed the Tesla Model 3 consumes 239 watt hours per mile, battery to wheel. However as discussed in a hierarchy of efficiency this is net of outlet to wheel charging losses. 
A non-highway capable pod car aimed at autonomous city use is feasible to operate at an even lower energy requirement than 200 watt hours per mile, on account of small frontal area, light weighting and other vehicle optimizations for operating in city traffic at low speed. Much lower than 200 watt hours per mile is possible if one were to bend the definition of a car in the direction of the architecture of solar endurance racers. Here 200 to 400 watt hours per mile is good for illustration purposes. To the rated capacity we must add some residual capacity to operate the battery within an acceptable band of charge states, to promote acceptable cycle life. On a Purcell basis, a lithium-ion type battery is rated fully discharged at somewhere between 2.8 and 3.2 volts but for safety considerations, total chemical energy is fully depleted at 0 volts, to include non-reversible reactions. All of the energy potential, including the charge ballast to preserve cycle life, plus the energy potential of carbon, aluminum, polymer materials, organic electrolytes and all of the other cell constituents that are combustible in air, but not counted within the usable electrochemistry, all of this is available to be converted to heat within minutes if containment is lost, regardless of the chemistry deployed. If it takes 10 minutes for a total of, say, 150 kilowatt hours to burn to completion the average heating effect will be 60 divided by 10 times 150 equals 0.9 megawatts and the peak intensity will likely be higher than that this is the average rated power of more than a thousand typical microwave ovens direct exposure to anything like this kind of heating power is clearly not safe for the human body Neither is anything like the rated power of 5,000 typical microwave ovens or 4 megawatts represented by the average of 666 kilowatt hours of gasoline, a full 20 US gallon tank, burning to completion within 10 minutes. An explosion is simply the case of reducing duration and multiplying the instantaneous power proportionately. Unless most of the reactants are thrown clear, a sub-second or sub-millisecond explosion incorporating an entire payload of 75 to 666 kilowatt hours of energy, is a colossal explosion by definition. Nevertheless, containing and controlling energy like this, metering it out in kinetic energy to the wheels, maintaining cabin temperature and the temperature of functional components at their designated optimum, and disposing of any remainder via radiators, or an exhaust pipe, is precisely the engineering required to move a vehicle. In the inverse sense, in design and engineering terms, engineering a product that is desirable, sufficiently safe and cost-effective, or better still, financially productive, for the customer, is the whole deal. This is the essence of development of mechanisms that do useful work, while deploying strategies covering a whole spectrum of causes with a view to preventing the effect being a loss of containment or control. Then onwards in the event of loss of containment and control to limiting the damage, such as an early warning, pulling over to a stop, to present an orderly escape route for passengers, limiting the extent and rate of propagation, and controlling the direction of energy release away from cabin occupants with firewalls and directional exhaust vents. Just as the parachute was the invention that enabled people to jump out of planes, in the broadest sense the difference between safe and unsafe is therefore the difference between invented and not yet invented. That is to say the parachute wasn't specifically the invention of jumping out of planes, it was a solution to jumping out of a plane that could be recommended by word of mouth. The same applies to nuclear fusion. It is not the case that nuclear fusion isn't a proven invention, that is what an H-bomb is. The safety question has not yet been answered satisfactorily for fusion as a constructive civilian energy source. It should be noted at this juncture that containment and control over the extent, rate and direction of heat energy of combustion, is completely ordinary in vehicles. This is a description of an internal combustion engine along with its firewall, exhaust system and radiators and the positioning of a fuel tank to breach to the exterior of a vehicle and not into the passenger compartment. Approximating this level of control within an acceptable mass and cost budget in anticipation of a one-time internal combustion event, of a battery, is a design consideration for an electric vehicle. Essentially a firewall and a rudimentary exhaust ducting system is required, in the event of a thermal runaway. Technically an instance of internal combustion. The remaining design and engineering effort goes to ensuring this is not ordinarily required. The particular issue with charged battery cells, comprising an oxidizing cathode and a reductive anode in very close physical proximity to one another within each cell, is that there exists the potential to unleash a self-oxidizing reaction in the case of a design fault a quality control escapee, 
disrepair after periods of time or duty, and in the event of external damage be that kinetic, electrical, thermal or corrosive. The issue is exacerbated the larger the cell and the more cells there are in close thermal proximity and it is mitigated in its most basic form, the smaller each cell and the better isolated one cell, or small group thereof, is from another, assuming the loss of one cell or some small group of cells is manageable. The technology leap from vehicles carrying 666 kilowatt hours of gasoline to 120 or fewer kilowatt hours of charge in a battery, is strongly positive in terms of limiting the extent of the damage upon total loss of containment. As is the massive compartmentalization of energetic materials into separate cells, which is a feature of only the most advanced fuel tank systems. For example the wing tanks of an A-10 Warthog that are designed to survive getting shot up, and similarly a US presidential limo. Dedicating mass and cost to strategies aimed at preventing and mitigating the consequences of internal combustion, ironically plus precautions taken to limit performance to steer clear of thermal runaway conditions, is the key rate-limiting step in the technological advancement of traction batteries and the second most important cost factor next to end-to-end -end manufacturing efficiencies and economies of scale. Just as it is with energy efficiency, it is equally important to keep the eye on the prize when it comes to safety. It is necessary to make the interior of a vehicle acceptably safe for passengers, not the interior of a combustion cylinder. Likewise one thing that is not legitimately on the list of things that need to be safe, is inherently safe chemistry, when the central objective is to achieve acceptable containment and control over as much chemical energy as possible, within reason, bounded by the customer requirement. Considerable counterproductive effort has gone into seeking inherently safe battery chemistries. Possibly as a hangover from the thinking surrounding single cells in phones or small groups of cells in laptops and power tools possibly in a bid to facilitate the use of large format cells, for which the world at one point had an excess of production capacity. Another driver of the counterproductive search for inherently safe battery chemistries has been a bid by OEMs to outsource battery-related liability to the supply chain. Counterproductive because the objective, no matter what, is to pack 250 to 400 watt-hours of energy per mile into a vehicle, with passengers wishing to travel some hundreds of miles. The demise of the A123 Fisker Karma combination in a series of battery fires, is arguably a testament to overconfidence in safe chemistry, to the detriment of sufficient consideration given to safe battery packs. All-encompassing strategies to achieve acceptable containment and control of a necessarily highly energetic chemical pathway, in a necessarily large capacity array of cells, necessarily involves a combination of cell, pack, electronic, vehicle, charger, software and transport system designed for safety, and onwards to include coordination with first responders, vehicle homologation authorities and insurers. An exploration of valid cell level safety strategies optimized for mass and cost. The most basic approach to cell level safety is to reduce the size of each cell, in order to limit the extent of a point source failure. Too small and the mass ratio of metal can or pouch materials, to active materials, becomes excessive. Careful selection of a metal alloy to minimize the mass fraction of a thin metal cylinder, while maintaining structural, thermal and chemical integrity to resist an oxidizing flame, sufficiently to direct the products of a thermal runaway safely to a vent and flame duct, is an optimization, at nil or negligible mass penalty. A round cell, technically a column, is advantageous in this regard for the same reason bullets are round to control the direction of hot gases. Taking the strength of this metal cylinder, that is required for one mishap per vehicle lifetime and ideally never, and reusing its strength throughout the lifetime of the vehicle as a structural element, defines the genius of the Tesla structural battery pack. This pack architecture resolves the conflicting design constraints between the imperative to minimize the weight of a vehicle, and the imperative for the vehicle to be built strong enough to carry a battery, one built from cells that are heavy enough to be safe. This is achieved by reframing the problem too, how strong do battery cells need to be, that when combined in a honeycomb structure, the structure is able to carry all the loads from the vehicle. In the case of the Tesla structural pack, improved safety is a mass penalty free byproduct of building the cell strong enough for their structural role. This really is a thing of beauty. From one perspective, repurposing the metal cans of battery cells as chassis members, shifts in accounting for their mass altogether from the cells to the chassis, 
for a net circa 25% energy density improvement, with no compromise to safety. Of course from the other perspective, it deletes a major chunk of the chassis of the car. Cell manufacturing consistency advances performance and safety at no mass penalty and it reduces the cost of rejects and in-market failure. Reduced variability of cell properties within a pack also sets the safe limits of charge state bandwidth, effectively increasing available energy density deliverable to the customer. Large batch manufacturing, parallel precursor batch scaling, batch tracking from precursor to customer device and extreme consistency of coating thicknesses, pressures and temperatures throughout high-volume cell manufacturing processes, aging to identify and eliminate abnormal self-discharge and matching cells in a pack by internal resistance, capacity and coulombic efficiency, all of this and more combined to assist in averting early failure and differential rates of attrition of an individual cell in a large pack, by bringing the weakest link in the pack closer to the average, such that no one cell is carrying a disproportionate load, or suffering disproportionate wear in service. Cell consistency within the pack also means that electronic balancing circuitry is under less load, leaving more energy available to drive the car. Developments by Maxwell Technologies, Hugh Duong et al., aim to tackle inherent issues of manufacturing consistency with traditional solvent-based electrode slurry coating, drying and calendaring, roll pressing, processes, with a dry battery electrode technology, not to be conflated with a solid-state battery. This entails the production of self-supporting films or tapes of dry mixed anode and cathode precursors that are then laminated at their pre-prepared thicknesses onto metal current collectors, metal foils, during battery manufacturing. In addition to electrode loading consistency, Maxwell's dry-coated electrodes appear to exhibit a lowered charge transfer impedance owing to use of a conductive binder that does not wet a complete particle at risk of leaving a residue, enhancing electrolyte exposure for reportedly significant improvements in power and energy density, as well as yielding improved cycle life, without added mass, while simplifying the manufacturing process when compared with seeking to produce an electrode from a wet slurry in situ on the current collector. This looks like a genuine win on several metrics without trade-offs. Update 2019, Tesla Incorporated acquired Maxwell Technologies. In the absence of unforced human error, very high production consistency in a well-managed manufacturing operation means fewer QC rejects. This is a vital component of safety and one that is materially hampered by commercial insistence on pursuing large format cells, on the assumption of per cell cost divisibility whereby a catastrophic point source failure that is readily detected by automated QC rejection in a small format cell, can be diluted to undetectability in a cell containing 20 or 30 times the value of raw materials. A large cell represents a relatively significant loss for the vendor or production manager to reject, creating a forcing function to seek a more lax QC rejection protocol, or to be cynical, just to lapse into one after validation samples have been accepted. Additionally, very large format cells for use in vehicles are typically required to contain parallel cells and multiple welds internal to each discrete cell as a function of stacking and winding, in order to meet power density requirements. The subcell within a cell consistency of such structures, is practically indeterminable electronically below the granularity of detecting the loss of an entire plate, for example a cracked internal weld, after the cell is sealed. In a composite cell winding process, Inconsistency is assured as a function of diminishing plate width unless reversed out by added complexity in the form of variable coating and current collector thicknesses, to approximate a capacity and IR match across the internally paralleled cells. A point source failure in a very large cell that is difficult to detect or reject an outbound QC is also very difficult to contain and prevent spreading to a pack-wide failure out in the end-user market, where it can impact a vehicle brand, at the very least. In layman's terms, building traction batteries with a small number of very large cells is not sensible or safe. The next good place to look for battery safety is measures to prevent the anode and cathode materials mixing directly. In an undamaged lithium-ion battery cell, a polymer separator performs this function. The separator allows ions to cross but not electrons, forcing the latter to go around an electrical circuit to complete the electrochemical reaction. Under some circumstances this separator can be broken by poorly formulated or contaminated cell chemistry due to the growth of crystalline dendrites. Nothing like this should pass into mass production and normally this is eliminated in R&D and pre-production validation steps. 
In older and less sophisticated cell designs this can mark end of life and most often it results in controlled self-discharge rather than flames, but not always. Another cause of separator failure is hot spotting, most often caused by attempts to charge a cell that is frozen or simply too cold for ions to move properly whereby the charge current concentrates in a carbonized track across the cell, perforating the separator instead of being absorbed by the chemistry. This should not occur in a production vehicle and is typically managed by throttling charge current and ideally routing it to thermal management to pre-warm the pack if cells are detected to be below a known safe charging temperature. The same applies to suspending regenerative braking until a pack is warm enough to safely accept charging, in addition to suspending regenerative braking, for packs that are fully charged to prevent charging to excess. In these cases as well as gross failure of a charger to stop charging when one or more cell is above a safe state of charge, and even in cases of impact, penetration damage or short circuit, here separator design can play a pivotal role in improving safety without adding weight. By choosing a separator material with a particular melting point temperature and specific properties upon melting, a separator can behave as a chemical fuse, shutting down the reaction, halting the flow of ions, in an overheated or damaged cell, as a result of pores melting shut and essentially healing penetration damage to prevent further direct mixing of reactants. It is also theoretically possible to poison or congeal, polymerize, the electrolyte as a function of a melted separator material. The objective here is to pick a cell death function that occurs like a switch, well out of range of ordinary operating temperatures, one that does not creep at percentages of the fuse temperature condition so as not to interfere with cycle life. The separator material should function to shut off the cell well below temperatures indicative of thermal runaway and ideally not ash to a defenseless state nor boil away or flame in its own right, until considerably beyond that point. Choice of electrolyte much has been made of the combustibility of organic liquid electrolytes as the battery constituent with the lowest boiling point and flash point. Also in terms of permissiveness for the formation of dendrites, with the conclusion that a solid electrolyte variant of the lithium-ion cell would be a holy grail achievement. This is prompted by the observation that venting with flame is invariably the outgassing of an organic liquid electrolyte and this occurs reliably upon overcharging a lithium-ion cell of this composition. Arguably venting with flame at relatively low temperatures and pressures is a desirable failure mode because it is controllable with cell vents and flame ducts, as opposed to pushing a solid electrolyte or other so-called safe chemistry, until it breaks down explosively or at very high temperatures and pressures. Nevertheless, in terms of headroom prior to vulnerability to entering either failure mode, a solid electrolyte such as zirconium glass, John Goodenough et al., inventor of the lithium cobalt oxide cathode and lithium ferrous phosphate, holds the promise of remaining stable at higher voltages than a more typical 4.0 volt safe ceiling for lithium ion, with claims of stability up to 5.5 volts, with questions at the time of writing remaining over ionic conductivity. Meanwhile Professor Jeff Don et al., Dalhousie University, currently contracted to Tesla, has proposed an ethylene carbonate-free, fluorinated liquid organic electrolyte, with stability up to 4.5 volts, that is immediately applicable to commercial production. Developments like this, moving from 4 volts to 4.5 volts, speaks to significant kilowatt-hour energy density gains in a traction battery, with zero or negligible additional mass or cost penalty per cell and with direct applicability to existing high-volume manufacturing processes, including direct compatibility with the aforementioned solvent-free Maxwell dry electrode process. These are clean downside free examples of the interaction of safely raising the bar of available energy containment and simultaneously lowering cost per kilowatt hour in comparison to the prior art. At this time of writing some early solid state lithium ion cells have been developed while at the same time, issues with dendrite formation in liquid organic electrolyte based lithium ion cells have essentially been solved by a combination of advances in additives and electronic battery management. Examples of multiple thousand deep cycle liquid organic electrolyte cells are now in supermass production and exist in medical devices, on the roads, in grid buffering and time of day shift applications. At the same time, the context of multiple kilowatt hour and megawatt hour arrays of lithium ion cells in close proximity in a high performance passenger vehicle or in grid storage use was not a feature of early industry and academic discussions surrounding solid versus liquid electrolytes that bestowed a mythical status upon solid-state cells as a solution to dendrite and undesirable SEI layer, 
solid electrolyte interface layer, formation as a cap on cycle life, and the flammability of liquid organic electrolytes as a limit to energy density on safety grounds at the level of an individual cell, such that it passed into received industry wisdom, that a solid state cell would automatically last longer and offer greater energy density while addressing the safety concerns of the day. With the benefit of hindsight, with observed failures of lithium ion battery packs of 10 or more kilowatt hours, we can now see, although acknowledging it is another matter, that the flammability of organic liquid electrolytes is an issue that is downstream of the brute physics of a lot of energy in a small space. To analogize to a log fire, with a large battery pack, rational concern ought to be shifted from the potential for tinder to catch light to the power of a mutually reinforced blaze. Whereas exactly the same considerations apply to solid state cells containing an equal amount of energy, overheated electrolyte in a small vented cell is unlikely to ignite and will not propagate from cell to pack in a well-designed battery pack. There are scant grounds in chemistry or physics to regard an organic electrolyte as a feasible root cause of a thermal runaway, one that removal of a liquid organic electrolyte could eliminate. In the case of uncontrolled overcharging, either a solid or liquid electrolyte will eventually let go, then the question must turn to the failure mode. It is entirely likely that a high energy, 10 kilowatt hour or greater, solid state system subject to short circuit or when crushed or penetrated by metal structures in an accident, instead of progressively venting with flame, it may instead melt metal, transition from solid to gas phase explosively and combust more completely in one shot than existing cell designs. This failure mode is almost certainly the default outcome of a charging fault, resulting in overcharging a SSB pack to the point of failure. The end result has been a lot of work expended in developing high-energy density solid-state cells that have reportedly achieved double the energy density of standard lithium-ion cells. This is assumed to be double the textbook 110 to 130 watt-hours per kilogram for lithium-ion, that current state-of-the-art automotive cells in large-scale commercial production have already surpassed by more than double the energy density, of the same textbook standard lithium-ion cells. At this point, Accelerating high-speed automated mass production of a cell produced from a wet or dry laminated electrode process, that is then injected with a liquid organic electrolyte from an automated micropipette, then capped in a dry room would seem to outweigh the pursuit of solid-state batteries, to eliminate dendrites or to seek electrolyte stability at higher than 4.0 volts per cell, which has already been exceeded at the state of development of cells in mass production. Bottom Line a solid-state cell that may well help in a cell phone or laptop will do nothing to improve the chances of a greater than 10 kilowatt hour lump of anything, surviving crush and penetration damage in a vehicle accident, let alone overcharging. In fact quite probably the opposite. Despite the potential to exploit higher voltage chemical pairings and to push existing pairs to higher charge states for elevated energy density, and despite the potential to fully automate well-controlled evaporation layer processes to produce very small SSB cells at very high rates, low ionic conductivity of solid electrolytes goes straight to the bottom line of high internal resistance. Hence energy lost inside a traction battery is heat, potentially limiting vehicle design and storage battery design in terms of round-trip efficiency and for cooling at ordinary power levels required to deliver motive power. This commentary looks at lithium solid-state battery claims of Toyota, Sakti 3 for Dyson and Bosch each of whom have made or implied claims of advanced performance lithium SSBs in automotive. While there are no hard physical limits to prevent SSBs becoming the cell type of choice, such claims are deserving of a considerably more cautious approach than promoters have implied. Authors note. As for John B. Goodenough, this author wishes him and his team another resounding victory. With gratitude and the greatest of sincere respect, Sir. Capacity attrition. Chemical energy, like energy in other forms never does exactly what you want it to do to the exclusion of all else. Even the simplest reactions like H2 plus 1 half O2 does not simply produce H2O. H2O is just the average and modal outcome at ordinary temperatures and pressures, with tiny amounts of all manner of other chemical species, ions and anions like H2O2 and H3O and so on. Ordinary water contains a blend of these species merely averaging H2O. In a battery that deploys much more complex chemistry, the simplest way to make sure the vast majority of what happens is useful, is not to push the limits of charge and discharge states until side reactions become a meaningful percentage of the total. 
the remainder comes down to picking chemicals and developing additives, to ensure that the species that are developed are either just as reversible as the intended electrochemistry, or that really unhelpful species, like solid lithium oxide, are somehow blocked or diverted from being produced. The ideal is to make sure none of the chemicals shuttling between charged and discharged states enter a side reaction, that results in something becoming chemically inert, or comes out of solution as a gas. A lot of effort has gone into preventing lithium-ion batteries depositing inert SEI. Solid electrolyte interface layer materials that block active lithium ions in an otherwise healthy battery, from entering carbon intercalation receptor sites. In non-technical language, to prevent a buildup of dirt that blocks pores in graphite, usually by inert oxides and fluorides of lithium. Similarly to attenuate or prevent oxygenation of the electrolyte at the anode. Naturally the tighter the range of charge and discharge states, the less energy is available per cycle for a given battery. Genuine technical progress here is to extend cycle life while maintaining or improving energy density by, for example, extending the voltage range, over which electrolytes will remain stable. While energy density, power density and cycle life at the cell level are inherently a technical issue confined to the disciplines of battery metallurgy and chemistry, cost is not. End-to-end -end labor, energy, space and transport cost savings, in materials gathering and processing to the finished cell, to the battery, to the car and to customer, can deliver cost reductions that are not inherent to the disciplines of chemistry or metallurgy, and these can even run contrary to traditional costings based on assumptions of materials abundance in the Earth's crust and the traditional market prices for various battery precursor materials. Many battery precursor materials upon closer inspection are not inherently expensive, but have instead traditionally carried a high price, owing to overcomplexity and global dispersion of supply chains and the effects of cartel pricing that largely went unaddressed in the arena of batteries for cell phones, where the battery falls a long way down the bill of materials in terms of price sensitivity, when compared with microprocessors, RAM and touchscreens and is buried by the value derived from software and data. Cycle life is all important to the lifetime value of a battery, whether in a car or in grid storage, potentially in one use case followed by the other, prior to recycling in the course of its lifetime. This is lifetime throughput. A 1 megawatt hour grid buffer that can deep cycle 1 megawatt hour 5,000 times processes 5 gigawatt hours of electricity in its useful lifespan. More with the avoidance of deep cycling due to more optimal battery management. This is 10 times the value of a battery that can be cycled only 500 times to process 0.5 gigawatt hours. This is a 10 times difference in value that can be achieved by a single electrolyte additive at potentially no, or negligible, net difference in manufacturing cost, in an otherwise identical battery. Going back to the very beginning of the discussion of energy, it is not energy in general but energy delivered intelligently and proportionately on demand, that is value. Hence a 100 kilowatt hour capacity battery with an average retained capacity of 65 kilowatt hours per cycle over 20,000 cycles is worth 1.3 gigawatt hours. At 12 cents per kilowatt hour retail, that is nominally $156,000 of electricity. This is not unrealistic for NCA tech used in today's traction batteries. Only the first 1,000 cycles at greater than 90% retained capacity is necessary to deliver 300,000 miles in a vehicle and there is a premium for newness, energy density and power density in vehicles that does not apply with the same sensitivity to commodity cycling on the grid, nor in consumer-side storage for homes and businesses. Update, there is now an announced initiative by EV newcomer Rivian, to design for and plan for second use of its, initially, 135 kilowatt hour vehicle packs. Quote, Rivian has designed its pack, module, and battery management system to seamlessly transition from vehicle energy storage to stationary energy storage at the end of their vehicle life. RJ Scaring, Rivian CEO. Update 2021. It is worth noting that the Tesla structural battery pack is seemingly a countervailing initiative. That is to optimize for cell quality and consistency and lock the cells into a structural element of a vehicle for a million mile lifetime whereby the strength of 46, 80 metal cans is not dead weight, but rather a load-bearing component of the vehicle and a contributor to torsional rigidity. Whether this obviates the reuse of these packs at end of vehicle life in grid storage is unclear. Probably so. 
It is arguably the case that reuse of the cell constituents and recycling at the end of anomaly million mile vehicle life is calculated to have a value that is either moot with running out residual capacity retention in a static application, or greater, when incorporated into a new generation of cell at that time. Cycle life and battery management. Cycle life is not merely a property of the cell and its chemistry. It is very strongly dependent on an interplay of battery chemistry, cell design, pack design, vehicle design, charger design and battery management. The latter both thermal and electrical. Cells used in electronic devices such as smartphones, tablets and laptops have electronic battery management, at least to the extent of preventing severe overcharge and overdischarge states from occurring, often with a thermal cutoff in the case of dangerous overheating, but generally nothing by way of active thermal management of the battery itself. The design intent in a small device is generally to use the battery as electronic ballast for everything else, from wireless circuits, power management and audio, even to essentially abuse the thermal mass of the cell, or cells as a heat sink. Most often electronic battery management in small devices is pushed for maximum device run time on a single full charge, bounded by safety, at the expense of cycle life, because this is what is critical to customer value in a handheld or laptop device, or at least critical to headline marketing metrics. Plus there is a perverse incentive for phone manufacturers to accept, or even favor, limited cycle life to prompt the consumer to upgrade the entire device on pain of battery replacement services priced for greater than 1,000% gross profit over the cost of the cell, in the case of batteries for premium smartphones. This scenario is not applicable to electric vehicles, where expected residual values depend greatly upon battery longevity, and hence cycle life is critical to customer value to drive demand and for the affordability of vehicle finance to facilitate a sale. Battery Management Vehicle applications are not forgiving of an absence of thermal management, where cycle life is critical to the amortization of the cost of the drivetrain if not the whole vehicle. In this regard, influence of battery management on allowable performance and attainable cycle life is as significant if not more so than the chemistry itself. The first step in achieving an effective battery management system for a vehicle is to characterize the electrochemistry of the cells in software, as well as the demand patterns of the car, thoroughly, exhaustively if practical. Ideally with the ability to update that software as real-world field data is gathered. Practicality and efficacy of such a program is greatly enhanced by cell manufacturing consistency, and deeply complicated by cell manufacturing inconsistencies. This is why as an initial premise, it is competitively disadvantageous for a vehicle OEM to outsource a traction battery, in the same way that it is generally a compromise to outsource an engine. At the current juncture in battery drivetrain development, surrounding the tipping point of cost and performance competitiveness with internal combustion, a few years of battery R&D, considered deeply and holistically with the balance of system, can make the difference between a battery drivetrain that is devastatingly competitive and one that fails to attract market interest, or even destroys an entire vehicle brand. A battery supplier that can model both battery and vehicle on behalf of an OEM, to deliver a genuinely comprehensive battery management system, in addition to supplying cells or packs, would be an interesting exception and an exceptional collaborator. It would make more sense at the very least to have battery, inverter and motor design under one roof, especially in relation to software. The battery, but more broadly the battery pack and its firmware and software is the main bit of the car. The battery management system distributed between battery monitoring, electronic and thermal, and managing cell level state of charge adjustments, thermostatic control of the cells, and the operation of the drive inverter, combined to perform the functional equivalent of an ECU, engine control unit. With an ECU installed, an engine's performance and life expectancy depend greatly if not completely upon the operating parameters of the ECU. The same is true of battery management as described. Once cell performance and vehicle demand patterns are adequately characterized in software, at varying ambient temperatures and states of charge, it is the function of the battery management system to weigh the immediate requirements of the user, for example in terms of motor torque, with the user's short-term interests, for example to not hit another car or to drive against the parking brake, with the user's medium-term interests, for example to complete a journey with sufficient charge to do so, finally the vehicle owner's longer-term interests in terms of avoiding conditions leading to excessive or rapid degradation to life expectancy and poor future performance of the battery that the user didn't sign up for. 
The latter consideration is allied to that of the OEM, in regard to warranty provision and brand reputation. In this way the acceleration available at the pedal may be moderated by an algorithm, aimed at preventing a momentary over-discharged state or a projected excessive heat at the interior of a cell. Without listing out large numbers of permutations, the key point here is that a state-of-the-art battery management system in a vehicle is massively multivariate and ultimately connected to everything. Never a simple matter of allowing a motor to draw whatever maximum current the cells can deliver or a motor can absorb. All of the limits are defined in software and not the physical limits of battery chemistry in the moment, the limit being a battery short circuit, or those of any other component of the drivetrain, such as the motor or motors. In a similar way, an engine with an ECU manages fuel-air mix, ignition timing and rev limits to prevent an engine overheating, sustaining excessive wear or flying apart when the accelerator pedal is fully depressed, as much with an eye to meeting goals of longevity as to providing instantaneous performance. A note on thermal management. Cell chemistry has higher ionic conductivity. The chemistry is more reactive, when it is warm, both to deliver high power and to accept high charge rates, including charging due to regenerative deceleration. Too warm and cycle life suffers, very much too warm, overheated, is to be avoided from a rapid degradation, or even a safety perspective. The effect of promoting ionic conductivity at raised temperatures overwhelms the marginal increase in ohmic resistance of metal components with temperature, hence a battery that is warm but not too warm is a good thing. Thermal management external to the cells is generally required to maintain a balance between optimum power handling and thermal degradation. Progression towards overheating must be managed by anticipating or communicating an overheating scenario to the inverter, to limit electrical demands placed on the battery, reducing power, to reduce heat generated in the battery, possibly the motor and inverter too if heat sinking is distributed perfectly. In this way a high-performance EV with a very low drag coefficient to facilitate efficient long-distance travel, may well out-accelerate an internal combustion vehicle every time in ordinary road use, but would require a larger radiator and a higher-powered cooling circuit to operate at continual high power. Heat transfer and differential temperature from the center of each cell to the periphery of each cell is a limiting factor that should be modeled comprehensively in the battery management system software, too. This incidentally loops back to the discussion about small versus large cells. Chronic differential temperatures between core and exterior of each cell will produce uneven degradation over time in use, leading to accelerated and progressive loss of capacity and early cell failure. Acute temperature differential between the core and periphery of a cell can cause a cell to fail catastrophically, without any warning recorded by an external temperature sensor. This consideration should contribute more than it does to determining the optimum size of a traction battery cell. A note on battery supply chain theory. Field failure and compromised vehicle residual values are typically many multiples more expensive than investing in initial cell format optimization at the head of the value chain. A standard management accounting model of value chain compounding, in other words internal and external margin compounding, with the battery at the furthest possible distance from the customer at the far end of the supply chain, along with items like nuts and bolts and lead-acid starter batteries, is likely responsible for batteries being commonly cited as cost-prohibitive to competition with internal combustion. Not because a battery is inherently more labor, materials, energy and engineering intensive to produce compared with an engine and a transmission, which is clearly not true, but rather when viewed through the lens of an auto industry tradition of buying millions of lead-acid starter batteries as a commodity. Similarly, the qualities of traction batteries are frequently miscategorized as not on the critical path to customer value. In the case of a traction battery for an EV, that is clearly not true either. The qualities of a traction battery in the context of an EV are just as critical to customer value as the qualities of an engine in a gasoline vehicle. Most of the performance characteristics of a vehicle are seated in the traction battery and how it is managed in software. Everything from curb weight and balance to acceleration and handling to longevity and value retention. To focus on range and price alone is to miss most of the point. An excellent and market competitive electric vehicle is not a given, solely as a function of increased performance and lowered costs available from the battery supply chain. Case in point. The Tesla Model S platform will very predictably gain marketable range, performance and cost efficiency over time in proportion to advances in the battery technology that is installed in the battery tray. 
whereas vehicles with a modular architecture, with the flexibility to install either engines or batteries, will become increasingly compromised as batteries make predictable headway. In terms of management accounting philosophy this would seem to indicate an imperative to move the battery up the value chain, to as close a proximity to the customer as feasible. Meaning that $1 of incremental battery cost, that adds properties directly critical to customer value, is charged as close as possible to $1 retail. Perhaps $1.30. Not for example $1 times 1.30 to store times 1.30 to line times 1.30 to retail which equals $2.97. If that's enough, creating an artificial cost prohibition to delivering a competitive product. To summarize the primary aims of a battery management system. In the case of a superbly well-designed lithium-ion cell, following release of initial capacitance at the commencement of discharge, a cell under a constant current discharge load for which it has been designed should hold a roughly similar voltage from a high state of charge until either the anode is depleted or the cathode is full at a charge state approaching fully discharged. Thereafter the voltage should descend rapidly to a low voltage with comparatively little additional charge released. If it were a graph it should look a bit like a lowercase letter h with an extended plateau before the final leg, and definitely no inflection in between the vertical and the horizontal as does the letter h, because that would indicate recursive thermal activation, resulting from the discharge current, which for battery longevity ought to be preconditioned by battery pack thermal management. A steep voltage drop off under load, the last leg of the letter h shaped voltage graph, should not be experienced in a vehicle, only in lab testing because it corresponds to excessive attrition of the useful cycle life and capacity retention of the cell, accompanied by disproportionate heat generation as a result of rapidly rising internal resistance as ion transport stalls. Cells are often produced with asymmetric anode to cathode capacity to avoid overloading the cathode by ensuring the anode depletes first. However, unlike a low-cost electric toy that slows to a stop or a flashlight that dims as a result of a dying battery, a lithium-ion-powered electric vehicle should never significantly lose performance, let alone stop as a result of the traction battery literally running out of power. Instead the battery management system should intervene long before this occurs to protect the lifespan of the battery. Perhaps some emergency condition could warrant intentionally sacrificing the long-term condition of the battery in order to allow the vehicle to accelerate regardless. Perhaps for example a rear-end collision avoidance measure. Perhaps the ability to slowly self-load onto a recovery vehicle. Perhaps the ability to creep some additional short distance to a known nearby charging facility. These are questions for software design and owner authorization. At this time of writing, current Tesla vehicles offer user-selectable control over a number of these profiles such as user-selectable maximum charge states with guidance for moderation to preserve cycle life. Insane or ludicrous modes that unlock increased maximum available torque and hence the power demands possible to place on the battery. Switching off these modes delivers a battery management profile better optimized towards cycle life. A range mode interacts with the motor controller or controllers, to maintain motors within an optimized torque band at the expense of high performance, and interacts with cabin temperature management to minimize ancillary loads. Just like an ordinary flashlight battery, an automotive cell will have a higher voltage at a full state of charge and a lower voltage at a lower state of charge, although not as pronounced. A simple electronic battery monitoring and management system can therefore detect the pack voltage or the cell voltage and approximate the state of charge from that information. In small and low-powered battery circuits, a voltage-triggered cell protection module that operates on this principle can function to interrupt the supply of electricity to protect the cells from a range of conditions including overcharge and overdischarge. In a higher power circuit for a vehicle, generally the bulk of the protection function falls to the motor controller or inverter which monitors and acts on pack voltage information, as well as additional sensors monitoring subunits of the pack for voltage and other parameters such as temperature, potentially down to the individual cell level as well as calculated statistics such as counting amp hours in and out. One key objective of a battery management system is to ensure each cell is at all times at, or as close as possible to, the average state of charge of every cell throughout the battery pack, so that there is no cell in an outlying condition that is dangerously overcharged or destructively overdischarged or suffering excessive capacity attrition on approach to either condition. Transport system-wide, Battery management extends to the concept of analyzing data for the weather, 
the inclination of the land in relation to least cost routing on an energy basis, naturally the intended length of the journey and the location of charging infrastructure as applicable, and onwards in an autonomous context to anticipating dynamic time and use patterns of all descriptions, tapped into literally any data that can enhance anticipation, anything from the user's calendar to the start or end of public holidays and to otherwise counterintuitive demand patterns picked up by deep learning. All of it with a view to ensuring each cell of a vehicle is profit-optimized in relation to cycle life, by safeguarding it from unwanted conditions, modeled in software, balanced with delivering performance and range at times and places a customer would most value. Perhaps the most important takeaway was covered under materials level efficiency. That is to point out that batteries are not fuel tanks. Vehicle batteries are electrochemical machines in the loop with the wheels, performing the function of an engine cylinder, with a rechargeable chemical charge and a voltaic push rod, connected to an electromagnetic crank, that being an electric motor, for the avoidance of internal combustion. This being a perfectly natural improvement, on a single-use thermomechanical primary cell, operating on the thermal runaway of its cell constituents.